Welcome back to the LED Project Podcast. This is episode 121, wow. um, and we are so excited, thrilled. Uh, I got my co-host, Will. What's going on? What's up? What's up, man? I'm loving life right now. I can't. I've been floating all day, exhausted, but I pushed through my entire day to get to this point, excited. And everybody's like, why are you so excited? I said, I got a podcast tonight with Gary Gray. They're like, who? I'm like, <laughs> Just wait till you hear it, you know. So it's you've been helping me get through, so I'm pretty Ooh. excited. And I was gonna say too, like I was so excited to introduce him that I almost forgot to introduce you. <laughs> I saw that I was an afterthought, but that's okay. I'm good with so, that. So uh, yeah, we're we're excited. Second time around, we've got our our buddy Gary Gray Jr. all the way from. Uh, uh, it's a Friday night here, but it's a Saturday morning in Singapore, buddy. How's it going? It's been good, man. Again, I want to thank you guys and first time meeting will but like i'm excited this is my second time with you guys and you guys have influenced me to create my own podcast so again thank you um and big shout out to what you guys are doing for education man it's been awesome yeah thank you i was i was just noticing like here i am in my basement like you see a couch and like my bedroom <laughs> in the background and, and gary's got like i see the jordan like up in the corner <laughs> and he's got like like the old transistor radio and i'm like Dang. <laughs> Dang, I gotta get I gotta get better digs today. I gotta. So awesome, I'm man! We're, we're, like I said, we're excited to have you. So, um, you know, we did a, a set of questions. So this time we came up more with topics, and you, know, you mentioned it. Um, talking about the podcast is, I mean, gosh, it's been a, it's been a while since me and you talked. I mean, yeah. So, um, so I don't know what when was the last when was that last time we talked? When was that like? Uh, I think I don't it was even know, like, like, a year? like April or May. I was going to say a year, maybe. Yeah. So, so yeah, man. So just kind of give us an update on, on what's going on over uh, in your world and maybe kind of reintroduce uh, yourself for the people that might not have listened to that first episode. Yeah. So I'm uh, Gary. Uh, I go, my handle on most accounts to social media is Gary R. Gray Jr., um i am named after my dad so the junior's not just like a made-up thing <laughs> i'm actually named after my dad and it's often confused um with family members but that's a whole nother story um i'm a teacher from um, nova scotia canada I'm from preston which is um largest black communities um together in canada i'm teaching in singapore at the singapore american school uh unfortunately i have never taught in north america um, I have only done um, teaching abroad experiences, um, but I'm thankful, grateful, and I've been learning a lot. <laughs> uh, information overload every year, uh, but it's been lots and lots of fun. Right, right. Yeah. You know, when I, and I looked back through, through the podcast we did the last time, and we talked, you know, about men in the profession and why that was so important and all that sure. kind of stuff. So it, um, I think it's somewhere, I think it's like 43 or 44. I'll go back and look, but uh, uh -huh. if you want to hear more about what we talked about the first time, you can go back and check it out. But um, we're excited, man. Cause I, I feel like we've developed a lot um, in our podcast, you know, and, and we've learned so much. And, and like I said, we've been going back and forth a lot about, you know, books you're reading and we want to talk about a book that we're both reading right now, but, but to get us started, let's, um, Let's talk a little bit about your podcast because I, I got to start yeah. first start out by saying like your podcast is like to the beat of music. <laughs> like, it's yes. like got production value. So I'm super impressed by that. But uh, just tell us a little bit about what's going on with your podcast. Um, I'll be honest, like you guys have been a huge influence. Um, not just saying it like I remember when we first talked, um, I thought about the idea of just sharing more information about myself and my experience. Um, I do feel like it is um, rare to have someone of um, from Canada who's black, who's um, a male in elementary. Um, I feel like it's different. So I thought, what can I do to just get my thoughts out about everything that's in my head? Um, and like Will said um, earlier, it kind of gives you a space where you can be comfortable. Um, you can be in the combined room of your your own space and you can share whatever you want and then you can let the audience comment or message you about topics or whatever the case may be um so basically it's a right now it's just a it's going to be about it's an eight part series about experiences that i've been going through 
talk about community, talk about family, talk about education. Um, and I do kind of have the topics written out, uh, but a lot of them are unedited. I write them up and then I just spit them out. Uh, the only editing part that does happen is with the transitions through um, the music. I also add certain parts of different songs. Sound, different. So the sound bites are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and that's honestly, that's just my love of um, like, I wouldn't say pop culture, just culture in general. There is like a usually like a hip hip hop feeling within most of them. Um, I've just grown up around hip hop and um, black culture. And that's been something that's kind of been ingrained in me. Uh, so that's kind of the idea of around basically a lot of the podcast. Um, and I've been loving it, man. It's been really, really fun. Really, really fun so far. Yeah. You know, and, and it's been such a, an, an interesting journey for us, especially this year. I mean, cause we, we set out the goal to do 52 and this will be our 106. That's crazy. That is crazy. You know, and, and I said this to you before, I mean, like we connected, like I just, I, I think, I think I, like I, I followed you on Instagram and I sent you an email. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't even know each other, but that's happened literally almost a hundred times that we either direct message somebody on Instagram or uh -huh. Twitter, or we just find their email on Instagram mm -hmm. and we send people messages and like, we've got six or seven people right now that we need to schedule out in the next couple of weeks. And Crazy. You know, we, we just re-released an episode with Tasha Wright, who is one of the founders of the, the group, The Right Stuff Chicks and, and the Teacher Heart Out Conference. And I think back to that and Will, you know, we were talking about this, like how many relationships have we built just through that one podcast? Oh man, that's, let's say it's, it's gotten us all the way to Vegas. It'll have us in the Bahamas this summer and wow. have us in Atlanta in March. So, I mean, wow. and that's just from that one connection. Yeah, wow. you know, we, we had her on the podcast and then she just was like, Hey, you know, if you guys want to come out, we'll give you a discount. So we, wow. went, you know, we couldn't, they had one this past weekend in Miami, but it, it just didn't fit into either one of our schedules. But then they messaged us and they were like, Hey, do you want to come and, and volunteer and help us out? And we were like, yeah, of course we want to come. That's amazing. Help. That is amazing. Yeah. So I, but, I think the, the <laughs> we'll go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. Um, I think, honest, I I think people, I think they're starting to understand the power of just like social media in general. Um, I go back to the same conversation that we had and just like my kind of journey in teaching like cultural responsive teaching in the classroom. Like this is new for me as well. Like I did a little bit through my uh, master's degree and how am I figuring out how to do it? I'm literally doing the same thing that you guys did. I'm messaging people on Instagram. I'm messaging people on Twitter. And these are reps from like Heinemann, from Reader's Writer's Workshop. And these people are writing back and wow. giving me advice. Like, how do, you, how do you get that, right? And why are people doing it? Like, I think people are overly kind, overly generous, but it's, I think it's the way of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, but I think it goes to what we were saying about that medium mm -hmm. of the podcast that it gives you that real space to be to be yourself. Yeah. And I think the more you do it, the more comfortable you get. And even like I know me, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I'll put on a podcast while I'm while I'm getting dressed and oh, just yeah. to make sure that I'm getting something positive and enriching in my mind so that when I go to school and I'm facing <laughs> my students. Even if I hadn't had a topic to reach out to them with, usually something that I hear in that morning will give me something mm -hmm. to kind of charge me up and say, hey, I got to share this with them. And I, you know, one of my students today made the comment and said, Ms. Law, you're the only teacher that we have that talks about social media and how they use mm -hmm. social media. And I say, but how many of you have social media? I mean, out of 33 kids, 31 of them held their hands up. <laughs> I say, yeah. so. They were like, well, why can't we follow you? I say, my, my page is, is, is public. Mm -hmm. It's not private. I say, now, if you, I'm not going to give you my handle, but if you find it. Because, mm -hmm. again, I'm still a little leery. You know, Kyle and I went back and forth about, do I make it public? Do I make it private? Mm -hmm. and, and I just realized that for the impact that we're trying to make, I, I don't, I'm not trying to hide anything from anybody. Yeah. You know, the I, I have, I mm -hmm. want anybody to hear it. I love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and, and the I same think, thing as a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think for me, I, I, you know, being that I'm, you know, four or five months out from having that rough, rough end to my last school year, I think, and I look at the podcast, all the podcasts we did, you know, from you in the spring through the summer, like, I think I just kept just such a positive attitude about it because Mm -hmm. I was talking to teachers and everybody was like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) strangely, (laughs) this podcast is so affirming Mm -hmm. because we've been working at, you know, on our nonprofit three years. And this is really like, been so affirming that people are just like, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. And, and it really is just simple of, you know, like, and we want to talk about how kids use it, but it's just, it gives people a voice that may not have that opportunity. And Will, I think you were talking about it on our last podcast. Like there are certain things that just are in your head that can come out verbally that don't come out when you write. For sure. For sure. There's too much thinking that takes place from my mind to, to my hand, to, to, to you know, it, there's too much. Whereas if, when I'm just talking and I'm just giving free verse, it just goes and it flows. And, you know, one thing, one word connects to another and another meaning connects to another. And that just doesn't happen when you write at all. No. I mean, like, I mean, I'm a, you know, I mean, I tell people all the time, I, I, I think I'm one of the best freestylers out here. <laughs> oh, yes, I was waiting for it. You know I'm gonna go there, and I, well, but, I was I was so sure you were going there. <laughs> <laughs> but but for me, it's like when you're sitting and I'm talking. Like I'll sit in my classroom and I'm just giving instructions to the test on Tuesday, and I literally start rapping, and I notice all the kids are just like eyes buck. Like wait a minute, I came back this that day. I called Kyle. I was like, man, I got to start doing math raps because I had them captivated just on instructions. Yeah. Now think about if I actually put content into that. I'm like, hey, I'm gonna have to go ahead and I w- didn't want to be an academic rapper, but hey, I think I may have to go ahead and throw my name out there, man. Because dude, there, I mean, there's a space. That's a, that'd be amazing. <laughs> yeah, and and amazing. I think it, it and it comes to that point too of, you know, and this is something I've been thinking that I haven't talked with you about, Will, but like. You know, we, we tried to launch our online mentoring academy and, and for whatever reason, we're not going to go, it, it just didn't work out. The pieces just didn't come together, but I was thinking about it. And the more I think about it, I'm like, this is, and, and to his point about being authentic, this is, this is, I feel like the space that I should be in right now. Like, yeah. it, cause we've talked so much about, you know, if we're going to add value to the teaching craft, like there's nothing more valuable than amplifying teachers' voices. Yeah. Right? And, and I, I really feel like, you know, the more Will amplifies his voice, the more his kids learn to amplify their own. Yeah. And, and crazy part is like, I'm doing the presentation that I have in a few weeks is based, it's called um, keeping it real with an authentic audience. And what I'm trying to do is talk to teachers about not just social media in general. I think social media is, an easy place to find an authentic audience, but why do we use an audience in the classroom? And like you just said, Kyle, how do we help kids find a voice and talk to them about why their voice matters? Right. Like, why is that not, why, are, why isn't every teacher talking about that? And why doesn't every kid know that what they're saying, what they're doing in the classroom is important? Well, you know, I'm, for a reason. I'm glad you said that. Cause I want to ask a question. Like, how do we get teachers? Cause I know that's one of the things that I'm struggling with now as a, now that I've gone back into the classroom uh, as a teacher leader on the front lines, it's hard to get teachers to buy into that yes. idea of have a conversation with your students. Yeah. Talk to yes. them. Find out what's going on in their world. Find out what, and, and I'm not talking about the pop culture. I'm mm-hmm. talking about find out what's going on with the individual student. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had a big powwow with my students about, hey, look, semester nine weeks are over now let's talk about how we're going to progress let's see how we've done you know and mm-hmm. i gave them a big spill on side say you don't know how you're comfortable with failing because no one's taught you how to reflect after failing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no one told you what to do and they were like mr law you you talk to us about stuff other teachers don't and in my mind i'm saying why aren't they mm-hmm. because they're afraid it's going to steal away from the content or they're afraid yeah. it's going to get too they're they're putting themselves too vulnerable like i don't get it yeah. yeah, I I feel I it's a tough. It's a tough question. You know, like I think I think the content thing is huge. I think sometimes teachers are in this situation where they're plugging in scores, 
They have ideas from administration, from on, on top of administration, like I need to make sure that my kids are at this certain average and then all those other things fall to the side. Like it's unfortunate, um, but like I, teachers like myself and you, like we think the same and I feel like it just, it would make such a huge difference in kids' lives if we knew, like if we knew exactly what their struggles were and how we could help them. Right. Yeah. Or even know what their success has been and let's build yeah. on those. You know, I had a kid today tell me, Mr. Law, I was, I was never been good in math until I came into this classroom. And I was like, well, what changed? You know, you're the same kid that was sitting in the class last year, just a year older, what changed? And they said, no, I've never been in a classroom like this. Wow. You know, so, but again, I'm also that teacher that doesn't mind stopping a math lesson to give a life lesson. Mm -hmm. you know, I tell them life lessons last longer. You know, life that. lessons are going to change, but life mm -hmm. lessons last longer. So whenever we have an opportunity, I use every learning experience to, to build on the other because eventually, like I told them, eventually by December, January, I should be able to hit autopilot and my kids run my classroom. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, not my classroom, their classroom. They sure. understand what happens and what should be taking place. And, but it's hard to get teachers to see that you got to release the reins and let kids be who they are yeah. and let them, like I say, that authentic voice, if they know they have a voice, they're more apt to listen to yours. Yeah, I oh, agree. Man. And I, yeah, it's getting deep guys. It's getting deep. <laughs> it's getting to that point, like, but that, that's that same point. And you know, you, you and I have been talking about race in that book we were reading. So you want to talk about race and all that stuff, but like, and we've talked about this too, you know, Will, in the past on the podcast, like I've never met a person who really felt good about themselves that ever had to tear someone else down. And I think the same way, you know, like you said, if I acknowledge that I have my own voice, I feel like I'm far less likely to try to diminish the voice of someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got to write that quote down, man. <laughs> and, but but that's that was but that's, good. That was but good. that's the thing and, and how many kids you know whether it's where i was in suburban you know or rural wisconsin or or in houston like there are kids everywhere i've been that don't feel like they have a voice and the more you give them the chance to have the voice yeah. the more likely they are that they'll acknowledge the voice of others yeah I agree. And I think with what I'm trying to do through having to be more culturally responsive, like um, in the book, it talks a lot about different ideas. And if we have kids having, if we have kids in, in the classroom and we're able to bring their experiences in the classroom as the individual that they are, like I have kids that are from America. I have kids who are from India, Korea, like China. If, if I'm constantly asking them or bringing their cultures into the classroom, they're going to go off into the next grade or into life feeling comfortable about themselves. If we're not, it's going to give them a, they're not going to know, like they're not even going to know what their identity is. So I think, again, if we are constantly having those conversations, it's going to make their lives way more easier as they get older, way more easier. Absolutely. And I, and I think even to that point, you know, I would really hope that someday we can take it a step farther where, you know, like, cause there's a, I think there's a difference too between knowing that I have a voice and not diminishing the voices of others. Mm -hmm. But I think the next step past that is, you know, I have a voice and then I acknowledge the voice of others. Cause that's something, you know, from that book, like I, I was reading a part about how the, the author had been stopped like six or seven times by the time she had turned 20, like in mm -hmm. a car and, you know, a, a black woman, you know, and I remember one time in Houston where I had gotten pulled over and I was sitting there with my hands on my lap and I, and I don't know what I moved and, and the cop was like, just keep your hands still, just, just don't move. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, no big deal. I'll just keep my hands still. But understanding like, if if a, a a black person or any really person of color could do that, it those are the things that really like turn those incidents sideways super quickly, and it's just like 
I've never really experienced that. I mean, I've only been pulled over a couple of times and I've never really felt like I was in danger, but reading, you know, listening to her story, I was just like, man, it, it's so crazy to feel like, cause she, she equates it to this, this traffic stop as an adult where they didn't even ask questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Will, how, what was, what, what, what has your experience been? I know this may, I don't want to get it like, too, we've already got like gone really deep here, guys. <laughs> what have, what have your experience, it's like, I guess throughout your life as a black male being in um, America, how, how have you seen it like change through time? Oh man, I think it's become more, um, <sighs> You know, some people say that that the that the culture has changed a lot. I don't see that. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember growing up. I grew up in the inner city, Houston, uh, north northeast Houston, near downtown, and we knew police brutality. We didn't have cell phones, and I mean, the camcorders back then were about the size of of microwaves, mm-hmm. so we wasn't going to be carrying any of those down the street. But we knew police brutality took place in our neighborhood. We knew that police didn't get charged. I mean, I think last count we looked at, they said it was since 1942 that a police officer has been charged in Texas. Um, so when you think about it, 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 the, it has not changed. The only difference is now it's being amplified with social media and you know, technology with people being able to see it. Um, my experience alone, I mean, I, like I say, growing up, my mom was very adamant with us about if a police officer tells you to sit on the curb, because back then it was stop and frisk. I mean, they, they could stop you for anything uh, in the early 90s. You could be walking down the street. If it was more than two of you together, you were going to get stopped. Like it was that we knew that. And so my mom would always say, I want you to come home. So whatever they ask you to do, do it. You know, two sitting on the corner, sitting on the curb, taking your shoes off, taking your socks off, giving them your shoes, you know, and turning your pockets inside out, them frisking you. And, you know, that was like a normal experience. And we knew just to be quiet and to, to, to deal with it and make ourselves, get, you know, allowed to be able to get home. And now the only difference is that our kids now don't have that same voice talking to them about how to deal with it. And now they're becoming more volatile, which is causing the police to even get more volatile. And the occurrence is happening more and more, they're more at, at a rapid rate. And so it's, um, like I say, I, 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 I can't say that I'm not excited about where we're going, the direction. I think the more conversations like this we have about it, the more teachers get involved with what's being done in the classroom, we can shift the culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it starts with, it starts in education. I mean, because we produce the police officers. We produce the, the criminals, even if we don't want to admit it, we do. You know, they, at some point they're coming through our schools. So we have the ability to influence all aspects of, of our culture. And we just have to do that very responsibly and craftily. Mm. That, that's my, I mean, I say it hasn't really changed much. It's just now wow. it's publicized. Wow. And that's inner city. And Go did ahead. you, Gary, didn't you come from a pretty rough neighborhood? I did. Like, I think I, I, I split between two areas, both called Preston. One was east, one was north. Um, it was different. I def- definitely different in comparison to um, Will's experience. We, ha- we got a lot of, like, driving while black um, comments made. Um, we still, in Nova Scotia, will get the every year i'll see at least four or five different incidents where the n-word is written on something and it's in the paper like we still get the you have to be your name can certain like mean that you're getting a job or not getting a job uh i think the idea of being stopped and frisked we don't get that um but we have a more likelihood of being charged for something, being followed um, in the stores. Um, our community does right now does have I want to I wouldn't say high presence, but there is a community center, and we do have like police within the community center. Um, but they have a close eye on us for whatever reason. Like they believe that 
it's important that we have police within the community, which is fine. Like I totally understand that. Um, but there's definitely like a stigma that they believe that, especially the males from our community um, portray. And it's, it's hard because a lot of the younger group um, growing up right now has, they've seen things and heard things and they are, I wouldn't say going down the wrong path, but they didn't have the influences within the, not within the community, but within the school system supporting them. So that's one of the reasons why they just don't know. Right. So they're doing things that aren't necessarily, I wouldn't say good or bad, but they're not doing things that are helping themselves. Um, so they're finding themselves in situations where they're not going to school after high school. Um, they're dropping out. Um, but this, with that, there also is a group that are doing the good things. It's just, it's just been better, but at the same time, I think we still need a lot of, there's still a lot of work to be done as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I had a conversation with my brother the other day and I said, you know, we, 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 we think about where we've come as a society as it relates to race relations and everybody, you know, some people are the pessimistic and say, oh, my God, we, you know, we, we still haven't gone anywhere. Then you have those optimists that say, you know, we've come a long way. And I told my brother, I say, right. I'm kind of right in the middle. Same. But I, yeah. But I think I have a broad view of the fact that the hurdle that we had to overcome is so large that Dr. King and, 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 and Park, Rosa Parks wasn't going to do it. Uh, by themselves. Marcus Garvey wasn't going to be able to do it by himself. It was going to take, it took generations to, 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 to ingrain us mm -hmm. with a mindset uh, of, of self-mutilation and self-degradation. So it's going to take generations for us to overcome that. And we can't look at it from a short, you know, short, short-sighted mindset that, oh, it's going to happen overnight. I mean, we've had a black president and we don't see anything different here in the United States. You know, mm -hmm. Chicago, they called it Chirac, you know, because you had so many African-Americans being killed daily. Like mm -hmm. this is like murder, murders after murders after murders. And that's the home state of, you know, our, that's where our president, you know, President Barack Obama came from. So um, they say that, that the journey is, is still there. We still need fighters and people who are ready to stand on the front line and, and lift their voice to say that, Hey, underneath it all, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I told them about it there. I said, yes, mm -hmm. I'm pro-black. I'm yeah. absolutely pro-black. I, I, I can't be anything but because that's who I am. And I love that. But that doesn't mean that I'm against anybody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I, totally. have, I have to look at it as saying no one's paying attention to. I mean, here in Houston, we have a huge Hispanic population. And we have ESL classes that are designed for kids who come into the United States who maybe don't speak the language or family just came over here. But we don't have programs like that for our, for our, for our African-American kids who are sitting in, in, in schools with teachers who don't know how to reach them and educate them in a way that's going to uplift them, that's going to help change their mindset. Actually, everything they do is kind of prodding that inner beast that's inside that's going to make them erupt. And which is going to, like, you know, can't talk about it enough, the school to prison pipeline that mm -hmm. that's very real here, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but like I say, I, I'm, I'm optimistic enough to say we're going to get there, maybe not in our lifetimes, but eventually it, the mixing has already begun to get everybody to say, hey, look, we're all the same. So let's mm -hmm. just ride it out and, and make it happen for everybody. Mm -hmm. So. So uh, the, I think the follow-up question I have, though, is, so, you know, we were talking about expanding and, and amplifying or, or showing kids, you know, that they have a voice. So what is, what do you think that looks like? You know, it, you know, especially with our minority and, or, you know, um, I'm trying to think of any marginalized group. I mean, because we, we know that um, there are a lot of marginalized groups. So what do you think that looks like I know we talked about the teacher has to amplify their own voice, but mm -hmm. besides that, what does that look like? Mm, that's a tough question. I think, do you mean like within like the content or the production of the work or, any, you know, any, anything in our day to day, you know, you know, for teachers who want to work 
on amplifying the student voice, you know, whether it be in content. I know, I know Will talked about how you, you know, engage them in conversation outside, but mm -hmm. you know, just, just anything of, you know, how do we work to amplify the student's voice and not, and I don't mean students like broadly, I mean each student individually. Cause I, I think, you know, it, it's kind of that crux of where we are, where we're trying to amplify the teacher voice, like plurally mm -hmm. on the whole, sure. but we really got to do it by amplifying as many individual teachers as we can. So how do we, mm -hmm. you know, really amplify individual kids? Yeah. I think for me, I think, what would help me the most was um, looking at uh, teachingtolerance.org and they're, they have like outcomes and standards for, um, I think they call it uh, teaching tolerance anti-bias framework, which yep. is basically a list of outcomes and standards for teachers to use to help students talk about all those different things that are happening in the world that are real. Um, I think one of the main ones out of that that can help push kids in that direction is identity. Like having kids understand who they are and being able to talk about themselves, I think that is like the start. Like you need to be able to know where you're from, know exactly, know your culture. Like the cool thing I think about our school and I think a lot of schools, like people, <coughs> you may be born in America, like which is fine, but you also have a mom or a, a dad or a family member who's from another place. Like that's also your culture. That's also your identity. Um, sometimes within our school system, like we're an American school and it's very Americanized, like kids want to be from America, but they forget that their mom is Korean and their dad is white. Like that means that you're like, you're Korean as well. Like you have to, you can't just forget about that. So having the conversations around talking about who you are and then whatever that production is, whether it's doing it through poetry, doing it through a written piece, doing it through a video, and then consistently doing that over time within other lessons, it could be math, social studies, science. I think that's the start and starting to get kids to realize like, for one, who I am and what I'm doing matters and my voice is projecting and it's allowing people to understand who I am. Mm. I think and then I think identity is like huge. I think it's again, I think it's one of the most important things that kids need to realize. Um, going all the way through school. It's like who are you? Like where are you from? Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I have a um in one of my classes I have um a large population of of uh, students who parents came from Africa. Mm -hmm. And when I'm looking at the roster and I noticed that the, these kids automatically set away from each other. Wow. If they set, like, I'm clearly looking at the names and I'm saying, mm -hmm. okay, you know, okay, there, I know me when I, I mean, when I went to, to Tech, Southwest Texas State University, the very first thing I did when I got to the campus, I looked for people who look like me. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I want to, I want to be around people who, 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 who dress like me, who talk like mm -hmm. me, you know, who, who have a sim sense of semblance to kind of help ease the transition. But I mm -hmm. saw these kids sit away from each other. Mm -hmm. And so I had them do an activity in the very beginning where they had to, I called it a sentence starter. They took mm -hmm. an index card and just wrote their name, just saying, hi, my name is da da da, and I am from boom. And so like, you know, yeah, kids saying I'm from Houston, I'm from Humble. And so they would pass it with their partner, their partner would, go and write. You don't even have to talk. You're just writing down and having a conversation on this note card. When I saw the kids, when I made them get up and switch, and now they have to exchange cards with other people to get to know other people and then mm -hmm. keep, keep the process going, those kids eventually saw that, wait a minute, hold on. And I saw them whispering, where are your, where, where are your family? Where's your family from? Mm -hmm. oh, my family's from there also. And that, mm -hmm. That changed it, but initially, it was like my mind is I want to get away from that sure. which looks like me, and I think that goes into that sense of the fastest way that you can break someone down is to steal their identity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. take away anything that that they connect with. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about Midwest values here in the United States, and you know, I tell people all the time, most of my friends are from the Midwest. You know, teaching here in Houston. And <laughs> <laughs> Dang right. Uh, 
<laughs> but there's something about there's something to be said about the culture that there that culture stays so close knit that mm -hmm. that sense of identity does not go away. And mm -hmm. here in Houston, it's like <clears throat> it's so spread out. And everybody wants to be like everybody else without really mm -hmm. understanding who people are. It's more of a keeping up with the Joneses type of deal mm -hmm. versus a, a true integration. You know, sure. like, you know, there's some neighbors here who don't even speak to me who live on my street. I've lived here for over 10 years. Wow. You know, but you live down the street from me and you don't even wave when I walk by or, you know, you know, it's just it's just real strange. And when I told my kids, mm -hmm. like, hey, I live in your neighborhood. They're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I live right by the park. They were like, what? And you're going to tell us where you live? I say, I don't plan on doing anything harmful to you. <laughs> Come and do something harmful to me. So, yeah, I need you to understand. Halloween's coming yeah. up. You better watch out. <laughs> no. I, I, look, I told them already. I say, hey, I, I, ju I do costumes, and I love to scare people. So if you think you can come to my house, you better check your bushes. You better check behind the car, underneath the trunk, because I'll wait. Stop <laughs> I promise you all. Wait. I got about six costumes up there. I will I promise you one of them will get you. <laughs> if it's not Michael Myers, it'll be somebody. But <laughs> you know, and 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 to your point about the Midwest nice thing, it, it and it's such a, a like I was thinking about identity, but I also think about your point, Will, about experience. That experience matters because mm -hmm. I will tell you, I. I grew up in the Midwest. I, I have very Midwest roots and we've talked a ton, Will, about how that family structure that I have, like mm -hmm. I'm in the point zero 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 one percent of how people grew up in terms of family structure. Mm -hmm. Like I have an incredible family and I had such a, a privileged life because of that. And, but I have those Midwest values, but I wouldn't trade my eight year experience in Texas to learn that culture and to understand that because there are parts of me that I took from Houston that will never, I will never stop saying, ma'am, <laughs> even though I get, I get laughed at or I get, I get talked to for saying it. Like mm -hmm. my kids will say, sir and ma'am, even though it's not common here because, and it's, and it's not like a facetious thing. It's just, it's a way that you address people in a respectful manner. And it's, and, and, the people that I met in Texas, whether they were from Texas, and that's one of the greatest things about Houston is you can meet people from everywhere. And I found, and, I, and I've talked to kids about this when I was in Houston, like there are nice, good people everywhere in the world. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But coming back to your identity piece, and I think it's kind of coming back to the voice piece. I mean, because if, if, if you don't have an identity, you, sh you certainly don't have a voice. <laughs> I Bingo. I totally agree. You might have a voice that is what you think. And I've experienced this myself. Like, my identity for a while was like, I'm going to be a CrossFitter. Like, I might not go to the games, but like CrossFit's going to be my thing. Sure. You know, and, and, and all those different phases where you, you try to tie your identity into the things you do. Mm -hmm. But my voice really hasn't amplified itself until I really got to my identity and I really didn't get to that until I started teaching with with Will and he really pushed me to he was the first person that pushed me to be like no your kids want to know who you are and I don't care if they don't like country I like country <laughs> we're gonna listen to country I don't care if you don't like it you know it, it's those types of things where I think you know that identity and I'm just thinking I'm not trying to go super political and be down but I was watching a story the other day that there's v alleged voter suppression in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Like 53,000 people are not being allowed to vote so far because there was an error in their paperwork that was none of their pedigree information. And even though 30, like 36% of the electorate in Georgia was African American, 70% of those 53,000 are African American. Wow. And well, you know, it's, it's really real because I'm going to tell you, when I went to go vote one time, it was like maybe six, seven years ago, I took my voter registration card and my license and I'm ready to vote. And I get there and they tell me I can't vote because even though I signed up for my voter registration at the same time I did my driver's license, 
my voter registration card said that I was a female. And clearly my license and my physical appearance tells you that I'm not. <laughs> and they did not want to let me vote. Um, what? Yeah. And so I remember that situation. And that was during the time when there was so much uh, suppression taking place here in Texas where they didn't want people to go to the polls. They didn't want African-Americans to vote because they understand that the minority, when you put all of the minorities together, we become the majority. Mm. And, and there's not a space that's really linking everyone together to say, look, if you really want the change, let's, let's be it. Mm -hmm. Let's be it. You know, I had a conversation with a little Hispanic boy who was walking down singing a song, throwing out the N word. And you know how I feel about that, Kyle. And oh, yeah. uh, so, I, you know, I didn't lay into him. I just asked him, I say, isn't it interesting that you won't speak to me as an African American teacher, but you feel comfortable walking around me saying that word? You won't even shake my hand to get to know me, but you think it's okay to walk around me and say that word. And ever since then, his whole perception has changed. Because again, you got to engage them in a conversation. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong. I'm going to engage you in a conversation so that you can think on your own about what's right or wrong. But, but why, why aren't more people doing it? Yeah, I think it's the uncertainty of the response or how people are going to react or what people are going to think about you. Um, right. And it goes back to teachers as well like and people in general like what when you talk about in like the book like it you want it like race is like this it's like the elephant in the room right it's like who wants to who wants to talk about it no one feels like they're comfortable talking about it or they look at race as like a black and white thing and it's not it's so much more than oh, yeah. what people think it is um and it doesn't have to be this hard conversation all the time mm -hmm. right it doesn't have to be that but again it, there's this idea around it and i think within education right now where it's, I don't know, I don't know if they think it shouldn't be talked about. They may not know how it's talked about. Um, so they're leaning towards the content that's just kind of put in front of them. Right. But I think you're right. I think people don't know how to talk about it. Yeah. It's a conversation that needs to be had. Um, but nobody knows how to generate. One of the teachers told me that, that they didn't want to do it because it makes them feel uncomfortable because they don't know how they would respond. And, and you know, and my thing was this simple: be yourself. Mm -hmm. And be tell, yourself. like, it's okay to say that you're not sure or you don't know. I, have, I tell my kids all the time: I have no idea. Let's Google it. You know. Right. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know, it's just like I say: I think we we don't know how to generate and to begin to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah, something I, that needs to happen. Yeah, I, again, I hope that eventually we as educators see that it is important, not just important, find a way to put it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And there's people online, like right now I, I use, there's like four or five people, there's more than four or five people, but people that I look at consistently and I, I message like directly about how, did, how do I do this? Um, one is Cornelius, he works for like Heinemann, and he is consistently pumping out information, free content on how do you talk about um, race in the classroom? Consistently. Um, Valerie Brown, she's consistently talking about race and talking about culture and diversity and all those things in the classroom. And she, for the amount of people that follow her, like Anne Cornelius, like it may not be the, like, the day you message them, but they message back. Like they will let you, if you ask about content or how do you put this in your classroom, one thing I love about them is that like I messaged out of nowhere. I was like, oh, these guys look really cool. They talking about stuff I'm interested in. Let's send out a message and see what happens. And they send articles or links to whatever you need. Um, Patrick Harris, like uh, President Pat, he does amazing things on Twitter. He's another person I can reach out to. I can say, hey, what are you doing in social studies this week? Like, I need a lesson on this. And he instantly messages back. I think people forget, like, just ask. Like, all you need to do is ask someone who's already doing the work 
or mm-hmm. Google it or whatever, and then start from there. It doesn't have to be an added thing to what you're doing. It doesn't have because, to be. Because we all know that we're all glued to our cell phone devices. Exactly. <laughs> and just like you sit here and you scrolling in, you know, that's one thing Kyle got me on real big, even when we started the podcast, was just like, man, let's just start reaching out to people. You know, yeah. there are more people who are going to say yes than that's going to say no. And who cares if they say no? Like, <laughs> Here's the other part. <laughs> right? Yeah. Who really cares? Because first off, you don't really know me, so I'm just reaching out <laughs> for just a chance invitation to see if I can, you know, get it, get to know you, and you know, it's just, you know, it just makes a big difference. Um, it does. <laughs> yeah, and I think that piece, you know, we were talking about why teachers don't, you know, reach out or or open up, and I think a lot of times for myself, and I think a lot of people that face this too is you're more concerned with the response you're going to get than what you're actually saying to that kid. So I think a part of it's got to be that you have to Mm -hmm. approach that conversation without expectation that you're going to get anything back. Mm -hmm. And, and when you can do that, then you're really making it about the kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and how many times will have we had kids where it took, or, or Gary, you, you have kids that it takes a whole school year totally. to get to. <laughs> and, and it can even start, I don't know how many kids that I've had in my time as a teacher that it started with just a nod in the hallway. Like you, you, you see the same kids all the time. Like you, I, walk to, I walk to the office the same time every day. These mm-hmm. kids are walking to their classes at the same time. So you just see them, you just nod and you just say, hey, like, mm-hmm. and you just start those conversations. But I think mm-hmm. even in life, the the less expectation. And that's the thing when we started talking about reaching out to people like you, we were just like, we're going to reach out. If one person in 10 says yes, you're good. Yeah. Like I was like, if I reach out to 10 people a week and one person a week says yes, that's our 52. (laughs) That's, that's a great strategy. (laughs) And and, and, And no, and no lie. And it's just, and you know, like we were saying with you, and you were talking about teaching tolerance and for us, the person we reach out to is Liz Kleinrock, mm-hmm. who's, who's been all over. Like she, she was all over like CNN and Buzzfeed and every major news outlet carried her this uh, a few weeks ago because she posted a, a lesson she did about consent and it wasn't sex related at all. It was just what was right or wrong. And she was doing it with her third graders and I don't know how many times we reached out to her in the last year and just asked her questions like when we, our Mac program that Will's running with his, you know, the music and arts collective, she basically drafted our digital citizen, citizenship, social media letter. We, we reached out to her and we're like, how do we do this right? Mm-hmm. Cause she knows and she understands that stuff. And, and those types of relationships we wouldn't have if you didn't reach out. Mm-hmm. And I think they get, and it even goes back to how do we help kids do the same thing, right? Bingo, bingo. Wow. You might mo- you have I to model it. The same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think social media is such a it's such a big world for social media and kids. If you don't show kids how to use it properly, I don't know. Like it's that you cannot you can't hide it. It's something right. that it's going to be there. If they're not using it, their friends are going to be using it. Um, it's going to be within the media that they're using, either on TV, through the computer, whatever. Like, there has to be a conversation around how do you use it appropriately? If you're looking for something, how do you find it? Because it's not going anywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, and, and to that point, it kind of circles to the, to the one other point we wanted to make tonight, which was global learning. And it's so crazy that through that social media, we're connected. Yeah, like the total distance that the three of us are apart has got to be like three thousand miles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so will will kind of you go into your to your desire to to incorporate uh, uh, global learning? Well, you know, I watching you know watching listening to you and and uh, people like Eric Crouch uh, talk about the impact that having the kids see something bigger than themselves. Uh, I think a lot of our urban youth, they're restricted to their neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, you think over here that Houston is everything. Oh, I'm going into the city and going into the city of Houston. That's a big deal when you talk to them about, you know, I was showing them pictures the other day. I was like, hey, guys, you know, I want to show you me standing outside of the airport that has the shortest runway in the world in St. Martin. And if you stand there, you know, you can feel the draft from the plane that will throw you into the water or throw you over the thing. And they were like, wow, where is that? Their mind is blown. Or we're watching, we're watching the news in the morning and they're hearing about stories that's happening all over the world. And they're thinking, but we're good over here, but I'm watching their houses and everything float away because they've mm-hmm. never been exposed to anyone engaging them in a conversation about anything else besides their neighborhood or mm-hmm. the right now. And so mm-hmm. one of the things I wanted to do is introduce them to the fact that, hey, look, how about you talk to some kids from somewhere else? Mm-hmm. Have a conversation with some kids so you can see how, how other people live and maybe give them a greater sense of appreciation for what they have and what their, mm-hmm. you know, what their, what their purpose is. Mm-hmm. So, I, I, uh, yeah, global learning is, it's such a, it can be such, if used properly, if, if teachers are more willing to reach outside of their classroom, it can be so powerful. Like, and back to the voice thing, it, like it shows kids that their voices matter and it can reach more than the teacher in front of you um, and your peers inside the classroom. And it can be really small. It can, I think it can start with the other third grade classroom or the sixth grade classroom at your school. Like it can be that small if you're not really sure. And then it can be pen pals, pen pals in a different country or different state. Like it's that it's that easy. Like you can easily go online, talk to someone and figure out where does this, where does my voice fit within this category that I'm teaching? Um, one thing that I've tried to do this year as much as possible is, is the same thing that you're doing is like reach out to people online. And this is what we're doing as a unit. How do you feel about it? Where does it fit within your unit? Can we have kids talk about it? And it's as simple as having a conversation, right? Um, the other aspect that I've been trying to incorporate global learning is through like math lessons. So I'm going to um, use like a, an app, I guess, or a website called Newsla. And it's a lot of like current events. And you can put it in different Lexile levels where kids can read it at a higher level, they can read it at a lower level, whatever you kind of need. Um, what I try to do is I'll go through Newsla and I'll find information that has numbers in them. So recently, in uh, Indonesia, there was a um, typhoon and talks about death and how many people died. And what I did was basically take the number of people that died within men, women, and children, and I put it in a math question. And then within the math question, they're obviously doing the math, but then we're having the conversation, we're watching the video about what's happening in this other country. What can we do to help these people if we need to? Um, so it's just not talking about why. If John had five apples and Luke had five apples, like, what is it equal to? So it takes it to a whole different level in a sense where, like, we're not just learning about adding and subtracting. We're also talking about those global issues that are happening in the world. And I think that's been huge for me this year. Just, like, what can I do within my lessons to make it more real and have students have those conversations, conversations about, like, actual events um, that mean something? It's been super powerful. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine. Because I even, like I said, I watch the news. Our kids watch, my kids watch the news every morning. Yeah. And um, you can tell when it, when, when it comes to something that catches everybody's attention. Sure. It's like a complete hush. Uh-huh. And you see them all kind of at the edge of their seats. And as soon as the segment goes off, you see hands popping up. And they're like, sure. they're ready to have a discussion about it. And, and I love the fact that you're saying, Let's go in here and let's embed these, let's find these math problems based on these numbers. I love that. Why not? Right? Why, why, why not? not? They're already engaged, so why not? Yeah. Yeah. I think and Kyle mentioned like, what was it, uh, the numbers in Georgia about like people not like that's a math question. Like, mm-hmm. and then the extension could be, how do you feel about that? Talk about how you feel, right? And then on top, like besides again, talking about adding and subtracting and multiplying, they're having the real conversations that I don't want to say it's just for adults because it's more than adults in the world, right? Um, the conversations that everyone else is having in the classroom or in the world. So again, it's just a change of mindset 
and having Absolutely. teachers kind of realize like, you know what, it doesn't have to be as basic as it's been throughout education. <laughs> right? But the basic is easy for teachers. You know, I, I, I agree. I share, with, I share with one of my assistant principals last night. Um, he was asking me, you know, hey, how's it going back in the classroom when you get your footing? And I told him, I said, I'm going to be honest with you. I am doing nothing that I did when I was in the classroom in this classroom mm -hmm. currently, because this is the mm -hmm. totally different demographic. Like mm -hmm. it was like week one, I, I think I was coming home and I was making IG live saying, man, I've never encountered this before. You know, mm -hmm. I'm an African-American man who grew up a true African-American inner city experience. And I get into tossed into this urban school mm -hmm. and I'm at the point in week one where I was like, man, did I really make a good decision? You know, <laughs> the, yeah. the, you know, is this really what I should be doing? Mm -hmm. But it forced me to have to adapt. Mm -hmm. It forced me to have to 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 grow mm -hmm. into what they needed. Mm -hmm. And the only way I could do that was to engage them. And I love the question you say. How do you feel about that? Mm -hmm. That that's one of the questions I always ask students. Well, that's just wrong. Okay, don't just tell me it's wrong. Why is it yeah. wrong? And how does it Why? make you feel? Mm -hmm. You know, we had the big conversation about our president and they were like, they wanted to call him names and this and this and this. I said, but you mm -hmm. don't like him because you say he calls people's names, mm -hmm. but, but, you think, but you <laughs> think it's okay for you to call him a name and you don't mm -hmm. see that you all are very similar when you're doing the same things. Mm -hmm. So now it's different. They yeah. don't respond the same way now because they're like, Oh, because he's gonna he's gonna tie us in that that we're the same way. I mm -hmm. tell him all the time, don't become the people that you don't like. Mm -hmm. That's your I goal. That. I love <laughs> that. I mean, man, I'm telling you, I, I wanted to do your the lesson that you had put out um on mm -hmm. uh identity. Mm -hmm. And I kind of modified it a little bit because our kids, they come from this, they sh how can I put it? They've been in less than um, less than uh, uh, conducive environments before sure. now, sure. and um, so I asked them questions like, "What do you think people outside of the school in the district are saying about our district?" And mm -hmm. I just wrote all the things down, and to hear them say things like "ghetto" and "ratchet" and "hood" mm -hmm. and "fighting all the time" and "loud" mm -hmm. and "disrespectful." And when they listed all these things, like there were no positives at all. I say, so mm -hmm. what do you think about when you think about the district? Ratchet, drug wow. dealing, this, this. Wow. And, they, uh, and so I realized then I have to help them change their narrative. I can't get them. I can't teach them math until I help them change their narrative because they, they're wow. waking up in the morning looking at themselves saying, I'm ghetto, I'm loud. I'm ratchet, I'm lazy, I'm this, because these are the things that they just said about themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now it's to the point to where, like I say, I have kids in my room who tell me, Mr. Law, I got to stop hanging out with you because you're changing me. Wow. And I told them, I said, that's a good thing. Wow. Though. That's a good thing. You know, in, in our ninth week of school that I'm already starting to make an impact. I was expecting second nine weeks to really start feeling it. But these kids, they're, they're hungry. They're hungry wow. for someone who cares about them. And, and I told them, you got the right one because mm -hmm. this is my life's passion. And, you know, I joke, one of my students say, Mr. Law, they should make a movie about your life. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. That's a beautiful movie. <laughs> and I started laughing and I was like, you know what? I said, but why are you joking? I said, you know, when you really look at, you know, sixth grade drop out of school, having to be retained, parents divorced, got into trouble, did a bunch of stuff I shouldn't have done. There's nothing about my past that says I should be educating the future right now. But there was a teacher along that pathway that saw something in me that said, no, nah, you can't be like your circumstances. Mm -hmm. You can't allow your situation to dictate your future. You have to dictate your future. And I think that that cemented in me the desire to say, hey, man, I we, we, we're in a great spot to be able to touch the future, you know, to plant a seed before anything else. And I think we, um, we're a rarity. 
the us three right here sitting here having <laughs> three men having a conversation mm -hmm. about uh about education uh, mm -hmm. uh we're, we're 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 definitely a minority in this field and mm -hmm. and i think the more we can get people together man i think we'll, we'll really be able to make a difference and make be able to make changes so mm -hmm. well you got me hype you got me hype right now <laughs> <laughs> man, this is perfect. But uh, you know, man, I'm looking at it. We're like approaching yeah. our mark, and yeah, yeah. Know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's Friday night. Will just got home. He's got to get some dinner, and we don't want to. We don't want to take up too much of your uh, your Saturday over there. In yeah. Singapore. So, so uh, again, for people who want to follow you, what's your what's your Instagram? Uh, my handle is Gary R Gray Junior. Uh, and Junior's Jr. Um, and what's the name of your podcast so people can go to iTunes and follow it and listen to it? Uh, it's really iTunes good. is called Teacher Talk Series, and I think, I can't remember now, I think I'm five of eight um, this week, and I'll be putting out six. Um, okay. It's been fun. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. little plug. So, yeah, <laughs> so, if, so those of you that are listening, if you go on to iTunes, um, make sure you subscribe and listen and, and leave him a rating and review. Uh, subscribe leave us a rating and review it would be huge for us but man so good so good to connect again and we're gonna have to make sure that we uh we do it again uh sooner rather than later man but we uh, yeah we appreciate your time absolutely yeah kyle will thank you guys again You've been huge inspiration in my podcast um and i agree if we, we need to even if it's not through video um we just need to message each other more i love these, yeah. these conversations yeah. they're like Sometimes you have those days where you are like, you're just wrapped up in like school and doing things, but this stuff like energizes you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Like, I feel like right now, I feel like I can start my day all over right now. <laughs> Me well, too. This is what I've been, I mean, I, I, I pushed through the day to get to this. So, I mean, like, this is like getting the cake and the icing on top of it all together. So. <laughs> no, thank you guys so much. Absolutely, man. Thank you for taking the time mm -hmm. out.